Welcome to the Behind the Curtain Podcast, your real world guide to real estate investment and property management. In today's episode, we're dedicating our whole time to chat about agents, what questions you should ask, and how an agent can be your best resource for information. Hi, I'm Glenn Green. I'm Aaron Ivey. And I'm Brett Bernard. So in the last episode, I made an offhanded comment about seminars. And I want to clarify that because I caught a little flack from... I won't mention any names, Aaron, but um, (laughs) (laughs) anyway, so I made a comment about uh, these these young investors going to seminars and coming out with the hair on fire and wanting to be the next Donald Trump. And, you know, we get a lot of a lot of those calls and I, I wasn't knocking seminars. What I was trying to relay is that there's a difference between a guy that's been doing it 20 years and a guy that's just started yesterday. There's a huge difference in their philosophy and how they look at the market and how they how they approach each deal, how they calculate ROI. Um, so I was just trying to draw a parallel. Now, there are some great seminars out there. As a matter of fact, I didn't know this, but uh, Enterprise Property Management sold a thousand homes through a uh, seminar Right, I don't, you don't even mention the name of it, and it was it was a basis of, of what really got enterprise property management up and running, and really uh, put them on the map. So, I understand that. I, my point was is that there are some great seminars and there are some bad seminars. There are guys out there that will charge you a ton of money to tell you stuff you already know, or sell you a donut with another a different color sprinkle on it. So when you go to do a seminar, which can be a wealth of knowledge for you, make sure you understand what the seminar is about. Um, if they're going to tell you stuff, if you if you read a synopsis on a seminar that you're going to take and, it, and to you, you're reading through it and it seems like a bunch of common sense stuff and stuff you may already know, then that's all they're doing is they're pitching an idea to you that you already know. You're pitching something, they're pitching something that has been done the same way for the, you know, the last hundred years. So look for seminars that are a little more out of the box look for seminars that can teach you something and not just refresh your memory of stuff you already know which then leads me to my next point i personally believe besides seminars and books and let's face it everybody's got their own philosophy and how to invest in real estate and they've got their own formulas they got their own uh, spreadsheets and how they calculate stuff but when it comes down to to buying and getting into investment real estate especially if you're new the greatest wealth of information you can get your hands on is going to be your agent. It's going to be the person that's boots on the ground, hands on, that has been doing this a long time, that is interested in building a relationship with you, so therefore it's in their best interest to, to educate you as best they can on the market. So I get calls from, from investors all the time, and they we talk, and you, you do, Glenn, and uh, after talking to them, you find out, well, I've made you know 10 calls of 10 agents, and you know, you're know you the first one to call me back, and I did this yesterday. you know, um, So finding your best agent, finding a guy or a girl that understands the market you're in, understands what you're looking for, knows how to handle the rehab side, knows how to work with the title company, and is involved with you after the sale, not just once they get their commission check to disappear. They're they're in this for the long haul. That's the agent you wanna you wanna hook up with. And don't be afraid to ask questions. Every investor I get, I tell them when we hang up. My phone is always on twenty four seven. As soon as we get off, you're gonna have ten more questions. Shoot me a text. And I do. They text me constantly. I even have investors that I've had for the last year that still text me questions from time to time. What do you well, think about this? I have what do you the think same about that? Thing. Um, you know, when a new investor starts working with me, <clears throat> there is a a set number of questions that, that the good investor is going to ask me. I'm going to end up teaching them about the Memphis market and the areas of Memphis and how, uh, you know, I've got one that said, can you calculate my ROI? And I said, no, I can give you a tool to do it with. And I'll teach you the finer points of it, but the ROI calculation is really yours and explain why. Everybody calculates it differently. And now, for, the, for the newbies, ROI is, is... Return on investment. Correct. It's when you calculate uh, your rent income and subtract from that 
all the fees associated with owning the property, taxes, insurance, mortgage note if you have one, and then putting aside money for repairs, CapEx, and determining what your whatever is left over is your return on investment. And it's looked at in dollar signs. It's looked at as a percentage of your rent or of the purchase price. Um, and that's how you calculate. That's what makes this worth doing, right? If yep. you're not going to make any money doing this, why do it? You know. And I, you know, with the other agents, we—I mean, let's let's face it. There are agents in this market that are specifically geared to investment uh, properties, uh, out-of-town investors, foreign investors. We are two of those. Um, they're also majority of the agents that strictly do owner occupants. Yes. And every once in a while they'll they'll dip their toe in the investment market if someone asks them to and they'll they'll uh, <clears throat> help an investor find a property. So what I would caution people against is just picking up the phone and simply because it's a big name, a big big name in the in the in the country and just grabbing the first agent you can saying, "Hey, I want to buy investment property." You've got to interview that agent you need to understand if that agent knows what they're doing because look a good agent is going to protect your interest first and foremost nothing else matters but pr- protecting your interest because that's why right. that's right we don't want you just to buy one house we eventually want to be the guy you bought 10 houses from um, enterprise manages those properties and does it in a way to because they don't want those investors to come to enterprise and be gone in six months they want them to be here 10 years from now with 15 properties so you want to interview your agent in a way that makes you comfortable, but also educates you. And also you can find out if this agent really knows what they're talking about. Yeah. So I jotted down a list of questions and Glenn, you can throw in some too. Um, <clears throat> so when you call an agent, let's say you just were to call me, for instance, out of the blue, um, there's these questions I would ask that agent to see if that agent is, is going to work for you and if that agent is going to be good for you. First thing I would ask is how many investment properties do a year? Because every every agent sells houses. Yep. There's a big difference between selling Tom and Susie a three hundred thousand dollar house in Carrierville versus selling an investor seven or eight or nine houses in Memphis for rental properties. That's right. So that's very important. Find out how many they do. Um, what percentage of investment properties do you do versus owner occupant? And if it's anything under seventy five percent go find somebody else well i think that all right so here's some statistics there's about five thousand agents that are members of the local board the memphis area association of realtors of those five thousand about ten percent of them are really doing most of the sales Mm -hmm. so about 500 of those 500 the percentage of them that actually work primarily with investors is infinitesimally small. Yeah. It really is. And it's small because it's a business. Okay? Why why do I do well with investors? Well, because I was a corporate executive or ran a multi-million dollar firm for several years. I understand business. I've been to school for business. I've taken seminars about business, talking about education. Um, and I enjoy that building of a relationship that's not going to be just one house and hopefully they'll come back to me in five to 20 years and want me to sell it for them. I want to develop a relationship with an investor and build it over time and, and sell them multiple homes. And I want them to come back in 10 years and say, we had a great run, let's sell them all. That's what I'm looking for. But you, very, very few agents in this town do that as a part of their primary business. main reason that we hear from agents is because they don't understand the game. That's right. They're scared of it. They don't understand it enough to feel like they're – and that's good because there are, there are agents out there that will take on an investor – and have no idea what they're doing because they, they see a paycheck at the end. And then you have, in, you have agents that understand, look, I'm not qualified to do this. Let me send you to somebody else who will. Mm-hmm. And we've had agents send investors to us because yes. they're not qualified to handle it. So uh, the next question that I jotted down for, for an agent would be, how many out-of-town or foreign investors do you currently work with? And that's important because 
I could have three investors in Memphis, but have never worked with a guy in California or Japan or, or Israel. Um, because when you work with those guys that are out of town, there is so much more involved with information that you have to provide them. All the way down the photographs and driving down the street of that house and taking pictures of the neighbor's houses and, and a street view and just giving them an overall feeling of what they're buying. So to me, that's extremely important. Yeah, your system has to be set up. And Glenn developed a system about six years ago that yep. is specifically built for out-of-town investors. That's all it's done. It's, it's designed to make an out-of-town investor feel like he's almost literally stepped foot in Memphis and went and looked at the house himself. It, and it, it's a system that works for those types of investors that really love this business and enjoy researching houses and looking on, on different websites to see what's available. And so there's that education process, but these are folks that stay at home and open up their browser and they go to realtor.com or whatever site they like, and they just look at houses and then they'll jot one down and shoot me a note and say, what do you think of this one? <laughs> and then I'll run out and look at it. I'll and give at 10 them o'clock all the at night on a Friday, you're yes. like, oh. Yeah, without a doubt, it happens at all hours. Yep. Um, but that's, uh, that's what investors enjoy about doing this business, and it's what I enjoy. I do too, and I, I tell everyone, I work seven days a week, 24 hours a day, and I get that comment, you do too. <clears throat> I get that comment from my investors about, you know, I'm working at 10 o'clock on a Saturday night. Well, that's because you texted me a question, so I'm gonna answer your question. I've always <clears throat> been astounded when I call uh, another uh, <clears throat> brokerage and the message I get is, please leave a message at your tone. I'd love to talk to you. If you're, you leave this message after 5 p.m. on Friday, we'll get to you on Monday. If you leave it during the week, we'll get to you the next business day. I cannot think of a worse intro to a new investor. Think about that. I mean, that, that statement alone, what, the inverse, what that investor just heard was, I'm important to you Monday through Friday but I'm not important enough for you to pick the phone up on a Saturday or Sunday and work for me. Um, look, there's a lot of money to be made in selling real estate. You and I know that. But in order to do that, you got to put in the hours on a Friday night when you don't want to. You got to do the Saturdays. You got to do the Sundays. Yeah. You got to work hard. Sellers are not waiting on you. Nope. That's None. really that's really a newbie mistake if you think about it. The realtor that that wants the forty hour work week. I mean they they're not really paying attention to what's required uh, nope. in the market right now. For instance, uh, how often have you guys seen a multiple offer situation on a Friday night that goes through the weekend and then by the end of the day on Saturday or by noon on Sunday, they've decided on a single offer that they're going to accept for that property. And and then you go back and you say, well, how many offers did you have on that property? They say, well, we, we closed it at 20. You know, yep. after we had 20 offers, we just said, we're not going to accept any other offers. We're going to look at the ones that we've got. Yep. Um, that kind of stuff happens after hours when the seller Most and of the, the selling time. agent are able to actually have a conversation. Mm -hmm. And so, um, no, it, it absolutely requires that, that the two of you be paying attention, be available to the buyer, yeah. you know? Um, and if you're repping the seller, that you, you know, have the, the confidence and the organization, like you've both spoken about, to be able to take a look at those offers, look at the weak ones and say, well, these are weak, we're not gonna pay attention to these. These are the stronger offers, so really these are the, the two or three or four offers that you're going to be choosing from help the seller understand that after hours you know or on the weekends and then make a decision so on monday we get off and running again and and that's honestly where property management comes in we we're always working as well don't tell my residents that i don't want them to know that but um <laughs> But we're constantly working. We're working with your buyers and sellers. We're, we're trying to, you know, put the property management um, structure in place, you know, and then operate that um, for them. And uh, and that's a 24 hour thing. Real estate doesn't sleep. It's always there. Yeah. I've got investors in Japan, Israel, California and New York. And for me, I'm always on. Mm -hmm. And I've got one investor. He knows who he is. He calls me almost every night at about 
8 or 8.30. <laughs> I know who that is, too. <laughs> and he wants to, you know, chat. Did you see this one? What are we doing about that? He's right. always got something going on. Yeah. And I know it's coming. I, it's just the way it is. So I have California and Hawaii distributor or uh, clients, and they're hours behind me, and I've got one that's ahead of me, and I've got one that's 13 hours ahead of me. Mm-hmm. And you have to be willing to concede – your schedule time yep. to accommodate them if that because that means if I choose to wait till the next day to write an email back to my Japanese investor they're not going to see it until my tomorrow by the time they respond to it it's two days later right you got to get up turn on your computer and knock that email out at 10 o'clock at night so that they see it as soon as they get up and then you get a response back by the morning. You know, if you want to make money in real estate, it's simple: you eat, sleep, and breathe real estate. Yeah, absolutely. Monday through Sunday, all hours of the day. And yes, your loved ones will not appreciate that from time to time. From time to time, depends on how you structure it. You spend too much I've time working. Good. <clears throat> I've gotten good at doing stuff on the road, on the boat. That you, Glenn says he can't do that. Me, I can't do that. I can sit on the couch on the boat on a Sunday morning when we're God's still sleeping and just knock out, you know, emails and knock out CMAs and contracts. And I love it because I'm looking at the water working. And to me, that's been my dream my whole life is to not have to go punch a clock, go into an office, work nine to five. Great. Look forward to Friday being off. But then by Monday, I'm broke again. You know, it's just because <laughs> I drank too much or whatever I did. So my point is, is I'm, I live the dream on my boat. I can do that. And if you structure your business the right way, it works. Yeah, I think it absolutely works. I, absolutely. I think one of the things that's happening with the three of us and definitely enterprise property management, the other agents that work for uh, EPM Real Estate and all of our support staff, um, I, I think what I would want people to know is that we have had excellent energy for the last six years with our sales team. And that's only continuing. Um, we're coming out of a year of pandemic. Um, and in future episodes, we're gonna talk about how the property management company has been challenged uh, by the pandemic, how EPM real estate has been challenged by the pandemic. How mm-hmm. and, and there are different challenges. Uh, one year ago, we're coming up on the one year anniversary of the, of the real sounding of the alarm about COVID-19. And so over the course of this last year, we've seen the market do crazy things. And the only way to be able to keep up with the market and all of the changes that are in it are by being present. And so you guys have been present the entire time, even in the face of news reports and um, you just are a culture that basically says, stay off the roads, lock yourself in your houses, uh, stop doing business, stop any sort of commerce, don't make any major decisions. Uh, and and keep yourself safe safe because the world is is on pause. Well, for us, we were never on pause. That's you right. Know, I'll never many- be on pause. I'll be on pause <laughs> when, when somebody's delivering my eulogy. That's when I will finally be on pause. And I'll Until enjoy then, doing that for not you. Not going We had COVID going on, <laughs> and we had ten inches of snow. Yeah. Guess what? Two agents were out on the road in ten inches of snow looking at properties. Brad and Glenn. Well, yeah. we put the truck in four wheel drive. I'm not gonna lie, Glenn called. I I've been stuck in the house for over 24 hours. It, I was going insane. Sure. Glenn calls. He goes, "Hey, man, can, can you get out? I can't get out. So, but I need to go look at some properties. I'm like, I'll be there in 10 minutes. <laughs> I just <laughs> lock in four wheel drive, and we we had fun. Right. I enjoy driving in it. If you're in a four wheel drive, it's fun. It's safe. And so, and from the property management standpoint as well, um, we were I, I of course have an all wheel drive vehicle I was out you know checking houses every other day um, you know the, those of my staff that had all wheel drive were doing the same thing we talked a little bit about this in a prior episode um, but then in the beginning during COVID um, for our listeners uh, property management uh, was deemed to be an essential service mm-hmm. uh, so we were allowed to come into work well we half of our staff decided that they wanted to work from home remotely which is fine. We wanted to be able to respect people's decisions, especially during all the confusion, to be able to work remotely if they felt like they needed to. But as an essential business, myself, I, and three or four other staff people came into the office every day. So the key here is commitment. 
Um, yes. You know, even though Brett's on the boat, he always answers my call. Um, even I answer though, everybody's call. You, you really do. Uh, Glenn and I have had several eight o'clock in the evening telephone calls where we're just talking about, you know, what just happened with this buyer or seller or what's going on, you know, with the brokerage or whatever. So it, we're not just speaking to you. We're speaking to each other. Yes. So the, the synergy that you're hearing here uh, on this podcast it goes on all the time. We're, this is not a put on. No. <laughs> We're always doing this. We have this conversation multiple times, if not daily, at least two or three times a week. Yeah. All right. So the next question you want to ask your, your, your real estate agent is, do you perform or prepare comparative market analysis for properties I'm interested in? If their answer is, well, I could, just hang the phone up, move on. Because any agent that's an investment agent is that's going to put you into a property is going to do their own reason. I do my own research, whether you want a CMA or not. Yeah. I'm going to do it to make sure that when we write this offer, I'm putting you in a good situation. I'm, I'm putting you in a property that is overpriced, that you're going to be upside down six, seven grand immediately once you buy it. I want to know that what we're buying is solid. Um, so, yeah, I do a CMA for everything that you're interested in buying. As do I. I utilize, as as a licensed agent and a member of the local realtors board, mm-hmm. okay, um, there's a lot of tools they give you. I mean, you pay for this service, mm-hmm. but there's so many tools that they give you to use for free and uh, researching properties, mm-hmm. doing the analytics to provide information. Because the, in the, it, that's not so much – for my client is for me yeah. because I'm the one that's going to suggest to them what they should sell it for. And if I'm too high and the offers don't come or if I'm too low and I haven't gotten everything out of that property I can for my client, that's on me. Yep. Well, and you look you at know? this, when you do a CMA for sales or buying, um, another thing I, I noticed that uh, in dealing with other agents when I'm trying to buy a house for an investor from another agent, um, I'll do a CMA, and I'll tell them, you know, I went, you know, I went and noticed that you're priced equally with these these three houses on the street. However, they've all been remodeled. What? How, you, have you been in them? You know, they've been remodeled. I'm like, no. When I pull the list on Paragon, I click the photograph of that comparable, and I can see the interior of the house. So they don't even take the time to go and com- actually compare. The, com- the comparative market analysis one house to another. So they'll assume, well, this house sold for 110000 so mine's worth one ten. However, yours hadn't been up- updated since Starsky and Hutch was out. The one down the street is brand new. So that's very important. I think CMAs are very important. If the agent says, I'll do one if you want me to, then you just need to move on because they're not going to protect your interests at that point. Yep. Uh, next one, and this goes back to what Glenn said earlier, and this to me is huge. Do you work weekends? There's if no such thing res- as a weekend if, in our right, life. If their immediate right. response said, what day is, today? <laughs> is not 24-7 whenever you need me, get off the phone. Because unfortunately, you are you probably have a day job. So you're going to start looking at stuff at night. You're going to look at stuff on Saturdays. And if you can't pick your phone up right then and there and send a text to your agent and get a response from him or her, he's not the right agent for you. They're not the right person to be protecting your interests and helping you buy real estate. I agree. I can't remember the last time that I did not work seven days a week. That's why I have a home office. I don't consider it work. I get up, go sit down at my desk and do my work. I don't consider it work. I love it. I absolutely love the game. I, I get excited to get up in the morning. When I go to bed at night, I'm constantly thinking about, you know, my some of my investors and what they've asked me to do and what I need to do tomorrow. And it's not a I don't look at it as a job like it doesn't wear me out. Yeah, there are times where I just, you know, on a busy week on a Friday, I'll sit down with a beer and be like, Whew, great week. But, man, I'm glad it's over. Yeah. But then, you know, the next morning, Saturday, I'm up at eight and it's, it starts all over. Yep. One of the things that I find is that there's sort of a natural flow to business. I think in real estate, we basically, well, in property management at least, um, things get quiet usually about 6 o'clock, 6.30, 7 o'clock on a Friday night. Um, and unless I have an emergency or two, which you know we always have a couple of emergencies every week, I usually get from about 6.30 or so Friday evening through noon to 2, noon Saturday, uh, to by myself. 
you know and of course i've got three teenagers and you know we're, we've always got stuff to do at home and so I'm, I'm always involved there but but that's kind of my downtime that's my rest time um and i think most of the world even in the business world kind of kind of works in the same way unless you're working an offer right um so you guys are totally different i mean my parents were real estate are real estate agents they're still actively involved in sales um and they want to be accessible at all times um now if they take a vacation they take a vacation so we don't want to, you know, come across like we're, you know, smoking an illegal drug in order to stay up twenty four seven. Oh, well, you know what? But uh, we, Glenn and I, and uh, Cass and God went down to Key West a year ago, January. Yeah, yeah. And we we're down there for seven or eight days. Seven days. Um, man. We did the same thing every morning. We woke up, looked like we just got hit by a truck, but we would sit down at the kitchen counters. Big Granite Island, and Glenn on one side, me on the other side, and we'd work for mm-hmm. two or three hours. We'd write offers and we'd do deals and answer emails, uh, and then we would go out and hit the, you know, take the boat out and go have Good. some fun, and then come back and we go back to working. Yeah. So we worked the whole time we were there. Yeah, um, I think I think your uh, statement of balance, both of you, um, for for those who don't know, Glenn and Brett, they have created the sales team more or less together over the last three to four years, really working with each other every day. Um, uh, just they're very, actually very good friends and so um, as they've built this energy and this this um, this momentum that they have together um, they work with their buyers and sellers in the same way there's there when there's energy to be worked they work it um, and they and they work it until they've closed the deal or they're, they're moving on to something else so um, they also vacation together often and so when they are together they're they're just naturally having this conversation so um, um, so yeah, I love one of your earlier questions about are you work well no it was this question wasn't are you working twenty four seven was that yeah. the question do you work weekends weekends uh, do you work weekends <laughs> we don't know what a weekend is it's yeah, just another both. day to me right. it's another Saturday it's another Sunday I am going because everybody asks me the same thing are you working tomorrow well, of course I am sure I'm a realtor you know. I want to make money, so I got to work. And so I get up, do a couple hours worth of work, and then I feel like I've accomplished something. Mm-hmm. And then I can go work in the yard or work on my job. Well, that's the or, thing is that you take, you either work, you know, I'd, I'd rather work three, three hours a day, seven days a week, than eight to nine hours a day, five days a week with two days off. Sure. Because you have so much more freedom. You really can do so much more with your day. Um, and there are days I work 12 hours straight. You know, and then there may be tomorrow where it's Friday. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to work. I'm going to do my flower beds. I'm going to fertilize my grass and clean the house because we're God's coming home Sunday. (laughs) Do some dishes and laundry and all that type of stuff. Yeah. So, um, but I would much rather work seven days a week, two, three, four hours a day than, than, than just have to punch a clock and answer to a boss. Right. So the next question, this is very, very important that, that you ask your agent this. Ask them about their process of finding properties, uh, writing the offers, and taking that deal to close. And what I mean by that, um, Glenn, let's real quick go over the standard process that I think we both pretty much do the same thing. Investor, send you a property. Okay, this is what, what do you think about this one? Immediately we go in, we get in the computer and we look at the RPR, we pull, run a quick CMA, look at, you know, rent comps and then look at a map in the neighborhood. And then we give them an immediate kind uh, of a 30,000 yeah. foot view. Hey, the area is not bad. The ROI looks good. A house may be a little overpriced, but they may have set it that way because they know they're going to get lower offers. And then, okay, well, great. Let's pursue it. The next step is we drive to the neighborhood. We take pictures of the outside of the house. Take pictures that the listing agent doesn't want you to see. Right. You're going to see the true condition, not what's hidden behind the listing pictures, which is a very common Very, thing. yeah. So we, we take a photograph. We get some pictures of the house. We, I, know, I don't know about you, but I take pictures of the neighboring homes, the ones across the street. Sometimes I get people sticking their head out the door wanting to know what I'm doing, but I always explain to them, I'm an agent just doing some market research. Uh, take pictures of the street view. Because, yeah, Google Maps shows a street view, but let's face it, some of those may be five, six, seven yeah, years there's old. There's no telling how old they are. So once we do that, then we send those to the investor and we give them our honest opinion. We decide to either move forward or not. If we move forward, at that point, we write a contract, negotiate it. We then take care of setting up the inspection. 
Once we get the inspection report back, we then take that inspection report and get bids on what those repair items are going to cost. And then we go back and negotiate with the selling side for a better price to compensate for the the repairs. And that's very common, especially in places like Raleigh, Whitehaven. You're going you're gonna to have those issues. Especially um, on tenant-occupied properties. Correct. Then that contract and all the documentation is sent to a title company. We work with the title company to get it to close. They do everything by email and FedEx with you as an investor. Then once it closes, guess what? We don't disappear because then we're moving it into property management. That's right. Then once it goes into property management, and I know Glenn does, I do as well. I'm constantly communicating with Lindsay and Ginger about this new home, about things that need to be done. Well, the inspection says this, do we need to do this, this, and that? And I'll go through the list and say, well, yeah, we don't need to do that. We don't need to do this. But here's something that's a safety issue It's important we need to take care of. So then you would think at that point we're done. But no, typically, like with a couple of other investors, we'll probably talk in a couple of days and we'll talk about politics. We'll talk about family. We'll talk about whatever. Um, and then we'll move on to buying number two. So that's the process that the agent should go through with you. You need them to tell you, my process is this and I'm in the deal with you and I'm going to be in this deal and I'm going to be with you after it's over. I'm not going to collect my check and disappear to where you text me at eight o'clock on a Saturday with a question and I stop responding because I've already been paid. And that's very common, unfortunately. I hear that from more investors about experiences they have had with their agent. So we do get a lot of kudos. We get a lot of Accolades from our investors because we answer the phone, we work hard, we give information no other agent will give them. We we go above and beyond with preparation for how to approach that property for you. So, okay. So next question: Can you explain to me the different markets in your area and how they compare in ROI, value, and purchase price? And right, that is so super this, important. This is something you're not going to get from an outside education. And when I say that, I'm talking about seminars, whether it be a two-day or week-long or just what is the the knowledge about the Memphis market. My objective is to make sure that I only sell properties in areas that I knew is going to perform well in terms of ROI, appreciation, or, you know, when I say appreciation, I mean long-term. What is happening in that section of town? Mm -hmm. And so there's... I always want to be right on the cusp of the areas that are coming back uh, because that's where you're going to get your value. If you wait until it's already come back, then you can pay higher prices. So that education about Memphis and what's the difference between Whitehaven and Raleigh and Sears Crosstown and, and Rhodes College and Cordova and Bartlett and Berkeley. Well, I'll tell you, I can tell you those differences, but it's not written in a book and you're not going to find it on a website. Right. It comes from talking to your agent, your knowledgeable agent, about what he knows about the city. Your agent should be able to list out the various markets in that city and be able to tell you off the top of their head what the average sales price is, what the average ROI should be, what the average rent's going to be for that market. Because Cordova, I tell every investor the same thing, Cordova versus Raleigh. All right. And when I say these names, these are used to be their own towns. They're annexed into the city. So we still label them by their. These are holdings. areas of Memphis. That's right. what they are. So I, I explained to them Cordova. Yeah. You're going to spend one hundred and sixty thousand dollars for a house in Cordova. Mm -hmm. Right. If you can find it. If you can find it. Then. But it's only going to rent for 13, maybe 14, possibly fifteen hundred a month. But the difference is you're going to be buying a newer house. You'll probably have a little upper echelon of tenant um, you'll be in a, a little bit different type of neighborhood but but with that comes a lower ROI because you're paying because the, the, there's less risk there's less risk but the property values have outpaced the rent versus yes. going to Raleigh risk is a little higher but you can get 9 and 10% out there and you're going to spend 85,000 for a house Raleigh's about 5 years behind Cordova basically Correct. in terms of that, that redevelopment and improvement and having anchors in the area, I say Raleigh's five years behind Cordova. Mm -hmm. right oh. now, and, and right now, you can't get anything in Raleigh. When it comes up <laughs> on the listing service, it's you got to hit it. Right. Yep. 
Well, and so from property management, you know, I've been doing property management for 19 years, which is a long time for a 44 year old. Um, but one of the things that I've seen as far as the performance of these neighborhoods, it's it's very similar. You know, when uh, and when investors call and they speak with Brett or Glenn before they speak with me, they get they they hear about the the, the community descriptions from Brett or Glenn, and then they call me. They're going to hear the same community description, but they're going to hear it from a property management standpoint. We really want to encourage you to give us a call, speak to both the sales agents and with property management. You'll be stunned at how similar our take on this city is. It just mm-hmm. really is. When people ask me about Cordova, um, you know, one of the things that I tell them is there are, uh, Cordova is newer property, right? So from a property management standpoint, it's going to, it's going to, it's going to last a little longer in its young house stage, right? Like these houses were built between the mid nineties, late nineties, all the way up to now. Two thousand. Yeah. I mean, they're starting to build in Cordova again. <clears throat> um, there's a home builder that, uh, anyway, that some of the workers that work with me doing repairs, they are also now putting in tile and, you know, painting interiors and putting in windows and, and framing and putting up roofs. So Cordova is coming back when it comes to new construction. Um, that's a topic for another time, but it's very, very exciting that some of our investors in one, two or three years might even be able to buy new construction. Our economy might get to the point where that is an opportunity. You're not going to find that in Raleigh right now. Raleigh is going to have houses that are, you know, solidly blue collar to, you know, entry level management as far as the, the residents and occupants are concerned. The houses are going to be about, you know, they're built in the late 70s, mid to late 70s, all the way up until, again, there was new construction all the way up until 2008. Yep. Um, so there are some purchase opportunities that are out there. And the energies of these two neighborhoods, if we were just to juxtapose these two, and then we'll pick an older neighborhood here in a second, like Whitehaven, um, is that the the type of tenant that's going to be attracted you know, to these communities, they have different reasons for living there. People in Raleigh, they're looking for a safe place to leave their things so that they can go to work, work their job, come home you know, in the evenings, raise their children. Great community. I love Raleigh. It's one of my absolute favorites. Cordova is going to be one of the more um, self-conscious as far as image conscious type neighborhoods. And so the tenants that I work with in Cordova are very concerned about if their carpet is five years old, they're like, well, you know, you want to think about replacing the carpet, you know, or, or, or could I have a budget to paint the interior of my home? I'm renewing my lease for the seventh year. In both communities, we have long-term tenants that want to stay there for a long period of time. Um, and, and right now, neither one of those communities are distressed in any way. No. So like Glenn was saying, there's not a whole lot of product out there to purchase, which is also lending to there's not a whole lot of product to rent, which again, for the listener, we're seeing a, a, a heightening or an inflation of both sales price and rental price so yeah, i've seen that to, myself yeah and and to touch on one of the points one of the last things i'll say to touch on one of the points of what uh brett said cordova rents are surprising us every time mm-hmm. yes. um, we are renewing leases now and these leases are going up 10 to 15 percent oh year over year well the good news is they're keeping up they're they're not keeping up with beginning values to. but they're starting to catch up Correct. which is good yeah. Yeah. because i know three years ago you sell the house in Cordova for over one hundred fifty thousand dollars. There's no way you're going to sell it to an investor because it just rented for a thousand, maybe eleven $1, hundred dollars a month. That's right. Yep. But now you're starting to see it get to thirteen, thirteen ninety five, fourteen fifty. So that's that's the good news. I think a dream thing because Glenn, you just uh, brokered a deal for one of our houses in Cordova. It was one of the first times I've seen a Cordova house sell uh, to a, a, a cali- between two investors, right? Um, uh, and so it's being purchased by an investor for the purpose of being a rental property. And it's one of the first times I've seen this happen in several, several months because Cordova appeared to be priced out before. And what I want to really make an important point of is I believe that the way that the economy is going nationwide is going to make Cordova so much more attractive because it's holding its value. The mm-hmm. rents are coming up. Um, it's going to begin to make more sense on a cash flow level uh, to, to, to buyers because of the state of the rental economy in that particular yep. community. So when you were going back to like what does your realtor know off the top of their head that was one of my favorite questions you asked dude we know that's that so stuff. key yeah it's yeah. so key because look and that, now keep in mind i know the properties you're talking about cordova yeah. it's one of my investors that's actually buying it awesome the the two that we're working on now escocada and winship yeah okay well, so there's sterling ridge too 
Oh, okay. Um, well, see, you, if you yeah. go back to why my investor, this guy's from California, yeah, and the reason why I sent these to him and not to my guys in you know New Jersey or Florida is because I understand in California the average rate of return is four to five percent. Right. I was able to send him two newer homes that were rented with cash flow and get him between seven and eight percent RI initially with the potential of getting up to nine literally after these tenants vacate and we go up on the rent. Right. So to him, it was a gold mine. So yeah. You also want an agent that understands their investors, right? Yeah. That Those two properties are not built for a lot of our investors, but they were built for this guy. They're perfect. So, well, that brings us to the next question. Ask your agent how they calculate ROI and make sure it fits in with how you do your rate of uh, return on investment calculation, okay? Because I'm not being nasty when I say this, but most agents can't do a rate of return calculation. They cannot do an RI calculation. If they do it, they miss a lot of very important details that affect your bottom line. Mm -hmm. So you can't, I know every investor is going to have their own way of doing it, um, but you make sure that your agent's way of doing it matches up with you. Because if they tell you, hey, this is going to have a 10% RI, and you run it at six, you need to understand why they are, what, what are they missing? You don't want your agent to miss important details like that. Well, and I touched on this earlier, but every investor calculates ROI differently. Um, I have a spreadsheet that I use for that, and I will give it to them and then explain to them how it's calculated, what the factors are involved, mm -hmm. and then let them calculate their own ROI. Because I can send the same property to do two different investors, and one will say, oh, the ROI is way too low. And the other one will say, oh, man, that's great. Mm -hmm. It's all in how they calculate that return on investment. And so I just, when people say, how do you calculate ROI? I said, well, I can show you, but I can't do it for you because I don't know what you look at. Everybody's for. got their own idea. Yeah. And, and let's take, go back to seminars. They've, Everybody's gone to a different seminar. Right. And every seminar they go to where they teach you about calculating your ROI, I mean, everyone's got their own way of doing it. So there may be little differences here and there. But I don't mean that your ROI calculation, that your agent needs to be able to match it exactly. But just from them telling you how they calculate it, you'll know if this person knows what they're talking about or not. That's all. That's the reason why you would ask that question. If they, if they ask say, you, if they ask you what ROI means, you hang up the you phone just and hang up the go phone. And get away. Well, and then before we leave that point, you know, Glenn and I were talking briefly this morning about how the purpose of the ROI calculation is changing for the individual investor. Um, so, investors in this current market, it's March of. 2021. Uh, the Dow Jones is at an all-time high. Um, we are seeing just huge debatable. It's debatable as to whether or not the fundamentals are there to, to support the actual value in the stock market right now. Yep. Um, the stock market is professing. And so a lot of people are pulling real money out of the stock market at what could end up being all-time highs for a, a for a while, for several years. And they're putting that into real property. So real money going into real property. Um, so the point that I'm making is there are a lot of people for whom it is worth purchasing and owning and holding that real estate, even if it doesn't have super duper optimal ROI, which is what we were going for, you know, between the years of 2012 and 2016, that ROI was key. Um, and so now people are willing to accept a, a little less and it's it's actually, there's a value in, in, in it for them to hold onto that real estate, to have it cash flowing. Um, and, and so they're not looking so much uh, at the numbers when it comes to the ROI. So we also wanna pay attention I think you touched on this before, to the specific needs of purchasing real estate. What is the specific reason why that investor is purchasing that? And you guys are flexible. You know, you're yes. open and willing and listening. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I do have investors in RI calculation that are actually adding in a certain percentage per year of rent increase. And they're doing this over a seven to eight to 10 year period. And they're getting to a point where their ROIs are in the 20s. Oh my gosh! Because they're seeing in the next ten years, this house rent for thirteen hundred. Ten years from now, it's probably sure. going to rent for sixteen hundred. Right. Well, I still have the same amount invested. They'll calculate a certain percentage for repairs every few years, and they'll calculate it out. And they've got guys that are convinced they're going to get eighteen to twenty percent on these properties sometime 
in the next 10 years? If I could look out seven or eight years and know what the market was going to do, I'd be a rich man. (laughs) Wouldn't we all? All right. (laughs) Thank you for listening to Behind the Curtain Podcast, your real world guide to real estate investment and property management. Be sure to subscribe at BehindTheCurtainPodcast.com. And if you'd like to learn more about Enterprise Property Management's real estate services, please visit us on the web at EPMRealEstate.com. This has been a Sound Ideas Group production for Enterprise Property Management, Inc.